Hello, and welcome again to the Argyle AI ML Technology Leadership Summit. My name is Vicki Lynn Brunskill with Argyle. It's great to have everyone joining us today. Just a couple of notes before I turn things over to our panel moderator. First, a quick reminder to sp stop by our sponsors' virtual booths at any time during today's event and for the following week. Our partners are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience today. At any time dur during today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page and those do include complimentary materials information and meet and greet opportunities to ask questions throughout the session simply type into the q a chat and we will address your questions at the end of the session and now without further delay i'd like to introduce our moderator for this very very interesting panel uh vatsala sarathy managing director of technology finance and operations at stanford university graduate school of business we are so excited to have vatsala and our panelists with us for a discussion titled Data-Driven Business Value, AI ML Opportunities and Challenges. Welcome, Vatsala, over to you. Thank you so much, Vicky Lynn, for this wonderful introduction and for kicking off this session. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session focusing on building business values using AI and ML technologies. I am so excited to be here with all of you and look forward to your thoughts and questions as we move along in this discussion. We are very fortunate to have a very diverse set of panelists today from whom I hope we will see a fascinating exchange of ideas. Before we dive into our topic, let's do a quick round of introductions. And let's start with you, Balaji. Tell us about your work in AI and ML and also maybe Give us one lesser known fun fact about you. Hey, thanks, Vasala, and good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is having a great day so far. Uh, pleasure being here. So I'm Balaji Viramani. Um, uh, so I am with Union Pacific currently. I'm the director who handles data R, so data governance, uh, uh, Snowflake, data migrations, SQL Server, and also I have, I'm have i responsible of setting up MLI platform uh, for uh, Union Pacific. So that's that's my role here. And uh, the fun fact about me, I have a lot of fun facts, to be honest, and we just discussed about cricket. So uh, I, I keep going on. cricket. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Balaji. That's fascinating um, to have cricket as a passion even after so many years that after you migrated over from India. Next, we have Matthew Versace. Can you give us a quick introduction, Matthew? Yes, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> um, Matt Versace here. Uh, and in the uh, Fortune 5 AI healthcare space, um, helped, uh, got a unique blend of business, tech, education, entrepreneurial backgrounds, um, helped build uh, a number of their AI programs, helped found the, their College of Artificial Intelligence um, and, and brought in and matured uh, both cognitive technology, it's built around the way the brain mechanics work as opposed to machine learning, um, and also quantum computing uh, in that space um, and matured that program over a number of years. Fun fact is I'm a pole vault coach, uh, coach for 15 years, two continents, three states, four clubs, and one high school, produced a bunch of champions along the way. So we were talking about that as well uh, during the downtime. Back to you. Great. Um, it's indeed a variety of verticals um, and areas that you have worked in, so that we are so excited to have you here. Next, next, let's go to Martin Miller. Martin? Ah, thank you for having me. I'm Martin Miller. Uh, 30 years of software development expertise. Uh, my passions uh, go into driving solutions. I'm a builder. That's that's what I do. Uh, machine learning, I, I build it. I make it work. I make it work at, at scale and hyperscale. Uh, fun fact. Wow. Um, I've been in a movie with Dev Patel. Uh, yep. And uh, it's called The Road Within. You can see me in the last 45 seconds of the movie uh, with, with my family. And, uh, you know, no money earned, but it was fun to be on set with him. Great. I hope you get called into being in other movies as well. Um, and finally, uh, we have Sachit Kamath. Sachit, can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, hey, folks, I'm Sachit Kamath. I'm the Chief Product Officer at Eightfold AI. So as the name suggests, we uh, build AI solutions in the HR technology space and uh, have been serving a lot of Fortune 500 companies over the last few years. Um, I have a background in this space uh, with work done at companies like LinkedIn and Uber. 
where basically I ran products that uh, you know effectively use AI to bring a lot of different kinds of experiences to consumers, right? All the way from matching technology that was used in LinkedIn uh, to match job seekers to opportunities. And then at Uber, it was about payments and effectively using AI for making a lot of decisions about transactions. Um, in terms of a fun fact, if I wasn't doing this, uh, it would probably be uh, becoming a sommelier. Although what I've just heard is that ChatGPT has just passed the sommelier exam. So I think I'm a step behind right now. <laughs> I, I think you are. And we can talk more about it as well. Uh, what a wonderful mix of panelists we have. Thank you all um, for being with us today and sharing your experiences with our audience. So AI and ML are becoming commonplace in the business world, in, at least in terms of awareness and discussions. However, we don't hear very often how companies go about integrating AI and ML technologies into their business functions. We don't hear about how they started, how they built strategy, what functions were the first to adopt these tools, how they learned and evolved, and also equally importantly, how they used data to mark progress and measure success. So these are some of the areas I hope we can cover with our panelists today. So let me start with you, Sachin. In your experience, do companies integrate um, AI across the board broadly, or do they do it in one function at a time and then move on to other areas? Can you give us some practical examples of what you have seen different companies do? Yeah, what I would say is that we're very much at the infancy of the use of AI in uh, within uh, large corporations, right? Because effectively, when you think of AI, many companies basically go down to automation and what are the tasks that potentially machines can do better than people? So just to yeah. give you an example, some of our customers today, you know, effectively are using the AI to sort of automate the screening process when it comes to recruiting, right? So if you can think about it, for a human to go through millions of resumes and sort of determine who are the right fit for a particular role would take a lifetime. And those are the kinds of uh, things that where AI can actually come to the fore and effectively do that operation in a matter of seconds, right? And and those are the areas where we've seen adoption sort of at the leading edge, right, of utilizing AI for practical applications that just would be impractical for humans. On the other side of it, there are many things now that you can envision, right, where AI could be more useful, you know, in terms of some of, some of the new advancements that have happened with large language models. But I would say that most companies are very much at the, you know, sort of uh, at the starting point of figuring out how to incorporate these technologies within, within their companies. And it's an exciting time to be in the space, to be honest. Yeah. And it's still being in an infancy stage, I think, is great because, you know, you can you can explore and you can experiment with it. Matthew, what were some of the um, best and worst AI decisions you have seen made by organizations? Ah, well, um, it depends. There are many. <laughs> it, it depends on where they are in their journey, right? So you get a startup that's going to use AI to build a business around. You have a mid-tier company that's gotten through their beginning stages and now they're starting to scale. And then you've got companies that have gone from that to where they're really going further in the digital journey and they're really incorporating AI everywhere as a general purpose technology. So each one of those has the ability to make good and bad decisions on any one of those stages. So early stage, you know, um, um, early stages tend to be a bit more myopic, like AI is going to cure all the world's evils and, and, and concerns. And they forget, you know, that business value has to be established. And they think that AI is the business value. And it's not like, you don't care what's in your phone, you just care that it works. So that's an issue there. In the mid tier, when they're starting to scale, one of the things we found is that IT has to catch up to AI. AI comes in and starts doing wonderful things. Just in, let's just look at the machine learning space. But then the infrastructure has really got to come up around that to meet that. And those have to be paired. Now, that's a finding you see when you go down that road. And then on the more mature side, when they're beginning to wrap AI in terms of their total business journey, you've got your core aspect of AI, that your core product, the business you're in, right? And that, and AI can undergird that. But then it permeates throughout the rest of the organization, HR, finance, marketing, all these areas start to use AI, but at different rates and different clock speeds. And so yeah. those, those bad decisions 
come in so many different places, either your primary aspect or some of these smaller, smaller things. So yeah. back to you. Yeah. Anything you want to add, Martin? Yeah. So I, I concur with, with the panelists here and, you know, there, there's a learning curve, but I, I also equate, we're still in the early phase, even though it's been going for 20 plus years of yeah. implementation of machine learning technologies and the toolings all over the place. You have several vendors that go full cycle, you know, from the tooling point of view, you have customers that are just new to the journey, picking up these tools. It's like the first time they picked up a screwdriver and, or a hammer and everything looks like a nail when it's a hammer. And the, and the problem with that kind of thinking is then you will lean off into using your hammer to hammer at nails that aren't there. Yeah. And the, the reason I point this out is there are some solutions you can step back and say, well, that's actually maybe a better robotic process automation versus an ML, a machine learning process. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then the other puzzle piece to bring in here is, is probably how, you know, coming back to business value, do your business stakeholders understand these machines aren't self-sustaining. They, they have to be trained or retrained on some curiosity or based on triggering events or new information. And that is a, a tough one to chew on for people. I think, oh, I just thought it was just like a, a black box and it's fully contained. Um, that That's where I'm going to drop in and hand it back. Yeah, yeah. Great points. There is a question that just came in that might actually be an interesting question to address at this time. Um, AI has a lot of applications like resume screening, but there is also an argument that it cannot think outside the box. Balaji, you want to take this on and tell us what you think about this hey, argument? Uh, hey, that's a very wonderful question. Uh, I need to acknowledge it, right? So, um, so the machine learning concept itself there from 1950 when Alan Turing came in and he he wrote that book called Computing Machineries and Intelligence, right? So today, whatever uh, AI piece we do, there is something called Turing, Turing test we, we perform. So, so whether AI can actually get into a level of rational thinking like a human. So, so we have a supervised training, which is like, it just predicts, we, we give the parameters, like if you guys are quite familiar with the OR concepts, like, so, so we just give the parameters, sees it, okay, so this parameter is going through, then it's supervised learning done through the, the huge amount of data. And there is another place, which is what today's generative AI is all about, the, the cutting edge technology, like 1950 through here, like 70 years, we had not, not this much of noise in last decade. So what's making it so interesting is today we have unsupervised training. So I, a model can train itself over the period of an again and again and again and again, it, it can, can fetch the data. So now, uh, yeah, I, today uh, I know, Everyone knows ChatGPT for now, but many may not know the bar from, from Google. So if you guys can hustle with it, you can see the difference. The bar cannot kind of communicate in a way, it, it kind of like how it communicates to a human, but ChatGPT to a level it can. And this is an evolving, this is an evolving technology. We may get there. We may, we may, or we we are evolving, and we would get there. So, uh, it's it's like a scoring. We yeah. we are currently at ninety. We may get to ninety five. We may get to 90, 99 at one point. Um, to answer to that question very specifically, um, AI once it starts learning by itself, it it can start thinking out of the box, and we are in that journey. We're not there, but it is possible is kind of what you're saying. Awesome. Yes. Great. Now let's talk about the role of data itself in fueling innovation within AI. So I'll start with you, Martin. Can you talk about the importance of data strategies in leveraging AI technology, especially maybe training data for the algorithms and so on? Sure. Um, let, me, let me start with you know, there's, there could be a volume of data sources that build are built into a solution of any type. And those data, uh, you know, sources could be streamed, they could be um, batched, and, and, and then they're used for training, per se. And within that realm, you could have uh, a lapse of data, uh, elements missing. And so when you're using systems of that nature where there are different timelines of where the data flows in, yeah. you're going to have differing usage of how you can train it, the efficacy of, of an inference. And so you, you need to focus on your, your data tooling very heavily for automation. You need to have 
fail-safe mechanisms in place, what to do when a workflow crashes, um, yeah. how do you recover it, auto-recover it? Because if you have an inference on bad data, you, you're going to make the Wall Street Journal for reasons you don't want to make it. Um, and, and my goal is to not do that. And, and so I just want to point that out. Data yeah. is your gold. Uh, don't slip on it. Yeah, absolutely. Could not agree more. Sachit, can you give us some examples of how data helped you or your organization in any role that you've been in, in changing your strategy or course, course correcting? And what kind of business models did you build and work with during this time? So let me give you a uh, like a very specific example from uh, my time at Uber, right? So which is a company obviously that tries to move people from point A to point B. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, effectively in about a week, what happened is that people stopped moving, right? And now this company had to effectively figure out how to, you know, uh, move its people towards like solving the problems that needed to be solved. Yeah. And effectively, like the the challenge that it faced at the time was that it didn't have enough information and data about what people were actually capable of doing. So despite the fact that the Uber Eats business was trying to grow like insanely fast, uh, it wasn't able to figure out how to actually navigate the people movement within the company. And so that's a great example of like a data problem, which is you know uh, not understanding employee capabilities, employee skills, effectively impacted the company in a, in a negative fashion during those times. And, you know, you could read about sort of what happened. It's out there in the public, uh, sort of in terms of layoffs and other things that needed to happen. And then this correction of like trying to fuel the new business, right? Uh, interestingly, that's the problem that my current company actually solves, right? Wow. And so, you know, we have, we have started to do that, which is like use data and AI to sort of help companies navigate these sorts of changes at scale. And yeah. a lot of our customers are effectively using this technology now in, 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 in practice for making the sorts of moves that have happened, especially as these economic cycles just keep getting much more aggressive and much more impactful to your business. I think what we have seen is that there has been this movement yeah. towards adopting skills as the currency. Yeah, they're not only more impactful, these changes are happening at a faster rate and we'll talk about that as well. So great point. Um, uh, such it. So um, I want to ask a question that came in um, to Martin. Down the road, we may find that the ability to effectively use the old-fashioned search engine isn't dead after all. What are your thoughts, Martin? Absolutely. So I find myself, you know, looking at search engines and, you know, going out there without naming, you know, the, the top two, three vendors out there. And, you know, you come back with a lot of sponsored search and, yeah, yeah. Alternatively, I'll go into ChatGPT or something similar to ChatGPT, and I'll ask the same question, and I'll get a not a less bias on promotional reasons uh, return. Now, there's some recency challenges on ChatGPT on the, on the data set, but if my question isn't about something in a current news article or a current event or where the data is current, I like the, um, the impact of this generative technology applied back into search engines, and I would going to bite my tongue, but I'll pay for that service to not have sponsored placement, if that makes sense. Yeah. And that also leads me to think that the way people think about marketing is also going to evolve pretty rapidly. Um, Matthew, to talk to us a little bit about, you know, we start off with data, but there are different kinds of data and the data can evolve into learning, deep learning, and ultimately what we term as knowledge. But, um, you know, these are fuzzy terms, even for me. So how should leaders think about these terms and what are the differences between these terms? Yeah, um, awesome question, because there's a lot to unpack in there. Um, so when you look at, at data, <clears throat> you're really thinking of AI as, machine, as the data-oriented AI, machine learning, deep learning, GPT, you know, NLP, visual, right? That's a, actually a very small part of AI. I mean, it's what we commonly think of AI, but if you, I mean, I started my AI, AI journey back in the eighties. So we are, my aperture for AI is much larger. When you begin to move away from machine learning and it's ilk, right? Which have very hard limits. <clears throat> like it cannot reason dynamically. It cannot learn on its own. It cannot do a lot of stuff. What it can do, it does extremely well, but it won't be the core engine of a robot that walks around your house, cooks your dinner, cleans your house and walks your dog. 
right? But when you get into cognitive technology that's built around the mechanics of the human brain, like cognitive architectures, the SOAR cognitive architecture, ACTAR, AAR, many of these things that are basis to, for doing cognitive research under duress and accident malformation, things like that. Those are the engines that power military drones that, mm. that, that work on their own, that can look at an environment, that can change its mind, that can learn dynamically, autonomously. And what that does not learn off of data, <clears throat> that doesn't just learn off of its experience in the outside world either. It needs structured knowledge to be seeded with of the domain it's going to operate in. And we did this in the, in the healthcare space. And then it needs to know how to reason and think over that domain. Now, that's an entirely different aspect of AI. Yeah. And, and, and that's kind of moving more towards that AGI space at an engineering level. So when you start looking at these new kinds of AI that are going to morph together over time, and that's what we'll see. Um, you'll see data moving into structured knowledge. You'll see yeah. structured knowledge moving into another representation of its engagement in its outside world. Um, many self-driving cars are trained um, in 3D mesh modeling environments, um, and it learns how to avoid things in, in those kind of environments. So you'll see all of that change over time as these technologies merge together. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Balaji, um, I'm very curious to hear about data culture within organizations and data curiosity. How do we build this? Is it like a top-down approach or a bottom-up approach? And how do you even hire and retain people who have high data curiosity? How do, how do we even identify such people and build that data orientation as a culture within the organization? Okay, hey, such a great question. Uh, so uh, this, what you spoke about is a real-time problem, right? So in 2030, we are expecting around 1.2 billion to upskill. And uh, whoever is using uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, who, I'm sure you guys have been hit up with the ad. Oh, data, we need to use data as a product. Oh, you need to move your career to data. So, so that's a buzzword across, right? And for, for a reason, this forum is happening on this. Uh, every organization, uh, while we talk now, across the globe, they know data is the key cornerstone. So if data is not there, if you don't organize the data in a way it is, we don't have, we, we can't even talk about ML and AI. So, so that's that's our fundamental. Data is fundamental. Yeah. It is, it's it's your fuel for whatever we want to do on this ML AI space. Yeah. So this is actually most of the leadership, it's, it's top-down approach and also to extends bottom up. So I'll tell you why it is top down. The one leaders, most of the leaders understand it, right? So all our, um, all our leaders get this. Now getting that message to the bottom and bottom of our resources, our low level resources, upskilling them to the new yeah. technology. For example, we have people working on SQL Server, how to munch data. So they need to upskill. What are the new cloud technologies? What, 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 how, how do we kind of stream data? How do we kind of influence this data? How do we kind of curate this data for the next level, which will make a path breaking MLI use cases? So it's both ways, but it starts from top down to start with. I think top, top have already reached there, but whoever is listening to it, uh, high time, uh, get get your get, get your boots ready on traveling towards. Uh, the upskilling towards data. Yeah. So I'd say. Yeah. Um, such it. Um, talk to us about skill obsolescence and also new competencies that we have to think strategically about when we um, um, train our team as we embark on these projects. Yeah. So I, I think like a lot of corporations right now are starting to think about how they can become more of a skills based organization, right? And effectively, like, in the uh, sort of the previous world, right? Many companies would hire based on roles and people, right? And they would say that uh, in, in sort of the planning process that typically happens on an annual basis at most companies, yeah. you would basically make a judgment of here's kind of the budget that we have and here's how, here's how it maps to the actual people. And I think what a lot of corporations have realized is that uh, that is actually really sub-optimizing the entire problem, right? Which is effectively, that really ignores what do these people actually do and what are the skills that are needed for that company to be successful. And so a lot of corporations are now moving towards this world of thinking about skills as the unit, which is, you know, what do I need 
to achieve the business goals that I've set for over the course of the next year, the next few years? And mm -hmm. how do I effectively hire the right people that have those skill sets? So I think you talked about sort of data as a skill, right? How do, what does that map into, into uh, sort of the, the, the long-term goals that a corporation has and then effectively making the plans towards creating the right skill sets that can achieve those plans, that is where the industry is headed at the moment. And I think that kind of transformation is absolutely necessary, right? Because I know digital transformation has been one of those buzzwords that, that a lot of leaders throw around. But every time that you take something that's a manual process and you turn it into something that is automated or with technology that you know effectively becomes a, a piece of technology, it starts to emit data and it starts to add more complexity. So you solve one problem and then you realize that you know there's a whole other set of problems that you need to solve. Yeah. And I think that is kind of the really interesting thing about you know uh, the the space as a technologist, right? Which is there's always going to be an infinite set of problems to solve. And uh, you know, I see the skills required to solve these problems continuing to evolve. So in many ways, I think that's an exciting time to be in the space. Yeah, for sure. Um, Matthew, because of the fast rate of change happening in the space, people are constantly seeming to have to reskill and upskill, and that can cause fatigue, fear, or even uncertainty. How can leaders help their workforce deal with this? Perfect question. One of the key aspects in 2023 is we're going to see an accelerated acceleration in terms of, of tech and, and business, things like that. The net net of that is that us, we're used to having our skills become obsolete in about the 80% mark of our tenure at work. Because of this accelerating acceleration, that's now being pushed back into the first third. So you look at your tenure as a working adult from fresh out of school to the time you pull the plug on retirement, your, um, your uh, expiration date on your skills are really going to happen at about the first 20% to the first third of your career. And you're going to have to reinvent that. <clears throat> and then you're going to have to reinvent that again. Yeah. And so one of the phenomena that we're seeing out there because of the acceleration of tech um, and, and global coordination as well, um, is that there's the upscaling capabilities and the reinvention capabilities that, that need to happen because your job has changed so quickly that you need to change with it um, yeah. are going to be a vital part of staying relevant. So in a grand scheme, as that happens, what we tend to do, what tends to happen is we create a useless class. Things change so fast, an entire class becomes useless mm -hmm. to the government or to the, to the corporate and political system. And, and unless they have the ability to reskill quickly, they're going to get pushed to the fringe. So this is a very serious issue of how do we solve that problem, but it's due to the quickness and, and, and acceleration out there. Yeah, great. Um, moving on to um, another very important topic related to AI and machine learning is risks related to you know, embarking on this journey. Um, so Martin, maybe you can start off talking about biases and hypes. Um, you know, we know there are so many different biases and they start off, they go all the way from data source to decision making and you know anything in between. So talk to us about how we, we should be thinking about these and um, working to avoid some of that. Sure. That is a that is a hot topic in a hot area. Let's let's break it apart as what are you trying to accomplish with your solution and having a, a measurable KPI in some small sense and assume your data isn't perfect. Uh, that, that should start there. And what are you going to do with the anomalies in the data? How are you going to handle anomalous decision making? Yeah. And then, the, the, you know, step back a moment and, and be realistic. Am I looking to produce a 50% lift in my, my corporate revenue based on the solution? That may not be uh, a practical expectation. So put your expectations in alignment to where you are. Yeah. Uh, Matthew, anything to add? Um, yes. <clears throat> so this is one of the big realizations that we've looked at. A lot of the futurists are kind of looking at this as well um, as a kind of fallout from what they do. But 
the reliance on modern day media, as you look at who owns who, and the consolidation all the way up to these two or three global governing bodies, at least in the US, there's three. Like all media flows up through there. It has ceased to become an area of, of true news. And it has embarked in an area of propaganda and influence. And so what we look at as technical news articles and news journals, journals um, tend to be more of influencing rather than informing. And so when you look at the hype cycle that gets promoted around that, yeah. we can no longer look at media as an unbiased source. We have to put on our filters of what, what are they pushing? That'll go a long way. Um, but we have to make that realization that it's, it's, not, it's not a good, it's a tainted source of information. Awesome. Um, another risk I think related to AI and machine learning is, um, you know, when systems or algorithms don't function as expected or even become irrelevant or counterproductive. So I want to ask both um, Sachit and then Balaji, how would you think about uh, situations like this and how do we build guardrails from the get go so that, you know, these things are going to happen. At some point we are going to realize the learning algorithm is not working as expected or things have changed outside of its scope and it doesn't you know, produce results. What do we do to build systems that can address these or at least flag these things as they come up? Maybe just uh, to also like touch upon the bias point, right? In the previous conversation and also link to this, uh, the way to think about it is, right? Like one of the like flaws of machine learning is that it can sometimes just mimic the, you know, e effectively the decisions that have been made by humans, right? When you look at the data and you train against it. And sometimes if that bias is actually prevalent in those decision, in decisions that have been previously made, then you can potentially use that as a tool to amplify that bias, right? With machine learning. And that's the kind of stuff that where you need controls in place, right? So a uh, simple example that, uh, that I like to give here is that, you know, let's just say you were trying to hire a, a particular candidate and you happen to mention in the description that golf is something that would be a plus, right? Now you would basically, if you start to build machine learning algorithms that are unsupervised in this particular domain, what you will end up with is a situation which will you know, greatly favor men as candidates versus women. And yeah. that's the kind of bias that you don't want to inject at scale because you know, the damage that can be inflicted by humans obviously is much harder scale relative to what machines can do. Yeah. And so that, these are examples where uh, you have to have the right controls, you have to have the right testing, and you have to make sure that you know, you're not scaling bias. So those, that's a you know, concrete example of sort of where uh, there needs to be a balance here. Wait, Balaji, anything to add? Yeah, absolutely. So any modern new technologies, guardrails are very important. It is tested, and particularly in this space, right? Because uh, just imagine we are giving control to the machine to, to some extent. So I'm going to give a very real and intriguing example, right? So, so we have derailments. So uh, there are a lot of a lot of railway railroads. We want to stop the derailment. We can use machine learning for that purpose, right? So, so how do we do it? And uh, we train the models and make sure it is having the latest the latest and the greatest data and also supervised training. So we start with the supervised training and then get a model, whether it's working with, so you do the Turing test and whatnot, and then slowly move it to uh, unsupervised learning, see how the model is performing. So it's not like, oh yeah, we got the idea, we are boom, we are getting into product now. So there is a rigor and a vigorous testing process because we are playing with life. Right, yeah. so there, are, there are there are critical decisions made based on AI, believe it or not, uh, and uh, so that that goes through a lot of mental model to go and approve that solution and also keep updating. And that's why this question is very important, right? So, yeah. Yeah. so once we develop the model, it's not we are done with it. This yeah. is quite evolving, and um, in the current world, uh, so for example, the self-driving cars, we are playing with life. We. Well, uh, so the amount of data it's it's getting around, uh, it cannot mess up. So there's a frequent learning. That's where this current era, I believe, even though from 1950s we have this machine learning, yeah. this era of deep learning and generative is because of unsupervised uh, the the evolution we made on unsupervised learning and models can teach themselves based on the data sets they have today. Yeah. Live using live inferencing is path breaking. And uh, having said that, the, checks and balances and maintaining the, the ops is as important as we, we 
we we go in the in such a place we are at. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I just love how the example showed us what we can um, you know anticipate with um, if you don't have these controls in place, as even such as mentioning. So there is a good question related to this that talks about feeding AI algorithms with the right quality and volume of data. Um, what happens if we don't have access to it or the quantity does not yet exist? Um, how can you address this as a bias problem and use representative and high quality data? Anyone? Um, so that's a great question. So, so this is the business problem. So we, we, we need to think so rationally, right? So we need to understand what problem you are trying to solve. Are you trying to solve a problem or you are trying to get into the bandwagon of AI? Yeah. If you are trying to get into the bandwagon of AI, you don't have, you know, you are not having the enough data to go and execute it. Probably we need to ask those questions to ourselves. We are not ready yet. It, I can keep repeating about it. So it, without proper a clean data is the fundamental and cornerstone for all this. If yeah. you don't have that, if you have no confidence about your data, probably you got to step back, work on your basics, right? How to get this, how to curate this data for me and for my organization. So that's that's your fundamental check. Yeah. Matt, you talk about what Balaji just said about curating data. So, um, I mean, he's right. Data is king in the machine learning, deep learning world. You have to have that. The assumption, though, is that you have to get it from the outside world. Like you have to go and observe some phenomena in the wild that you're interested in, grab all the data you can, and then train an algorithm on that. That's not true. And so you start seeing, um, and that's an assumption that will work most of the time, but, but you can start developing synthetic data to train an algorithm with the way you want that algorithm to behave. So if you take a step back and abstract it, and you take a look at the wild and you get, gather a bunch of data, you're trying to model the behavior of that, that phenomena in the wild. Whereas now they're moving from, well, if I can't get it, how about, and I know how it's supposed to behave, how about if I just artificially create it in some fashion that's as rich and as dense as I would find in the wild, but covers all the use cases and yeah. eliminates all the concern bias that we have. And that's only in certain external facing areas. Um, so you'll see a movement towards synthetic data uh, to help solve that problem. I'll back to you. Yeah. Um... I know we um, are coming up in time and there are a couple of good questions, but before we look at some of those, one last area that I want to um, address is there has been, so we all know that the adoption of AI is not the same across all industries, all companies, all functions. There are delayed adoptions um, within certain core business processes. So let's talk a little bit about that and why is that and what can we do? So let's start with you, Sachin. Yeah, so I mean, this uh, inertia that exists in corporations is very real, right? Even for applications that are somewhat mature, you still have to sort of make the very core business case about, you know, is it a cost savings argument or is it, you know, a revenue uh, growth ar argument, right? From a from an internal perspective. And then what we do find is at times there are real conversations that need to be had about if there is automation that is going to enter the space, like what are the people that are effectively doing those jobs? How are they going to be transitioned to other things within the organization? And these are like really hard core things that need to be solved within any company, right? So what I would say is that, uh, you know, until uh, many of these corporations see the, the, the clear value, the clear business case, and then effectively understand how to manage the change within the organization, it is still going to be a slow roll for the most part regardless of whether it's a mature application, it's a completely brand new application. But yeah. at the same time, what I would say is that it's becoming much more clear what the value is in particularly like certain roles, right? Which are gonna change very, very materially. An example is like the, uh, the role of a copywriter is gonna fundamentally change if it hasn't already, given the generative technology that is out there now. So yeah. these are the kinds of things that I think a lot of companies are actually grappling with. And it is a very real struggle, right? To make the shift towards adopting these technologies. Yeah. And it's also quite related with the upskilling, reskilling. The relationship between man and machine is also changing and how we think about that. So that's a very interesting topic as well. Um, and when different functions adopt these processes at different rates, how do you bring together teams, uh, roles and responsibilities, or even build organizational structure? Anyone? 
So let me take a stab at that, and then I'm going to punt over to to, to Bali. Bali. Um, <clears throat> so there, the adoption rate, and let's be clear, is abysmal in big orgs with AI, and there's various reasons for it. Um, but it's not nearly as far along as we had anticipated. Um, as you um, begin those your your journey along those lines. Um, the um, the three things that were of issue that at least to blame was data, infrastructure, and talent. Mm -hmm. And we have solved all those problems. Um, and the last was as we began to teach AI to the managerial staff, our ranks their own, that's when we found one of the real impediments to it. Now, um, as companies start building AI into their core business, that's one aspect of it. <clears throat> that's what they're going to try to do first. But then they're going to note that AI can really play a, a magnificent role, considering it's a general purpose technology. It should infest everything in all of the other supporting areas of the business as well, like HR, marketing, finance, um, you name it. So they'll start seeing a different clock speeds in how AI gets adopted in the core business itself, a thing you do for business, and then those supporting uh, departments that really kind of make things run. So, um, and then I'm going to punt over. So I'll pass the baton. Great. Anyone else? Um, there are a couple of other questions I want to get to as well. Okay, so there is an interesting question um, related to the hype and also the um, governance and so on. Is government regulation going to make any significant difference or is the cap already out of the bag? Yeah, so maybe I can jump in here, right? So the best way I can put it is I think that uh, the rules of the road are still being written, right? In many ways in terms of what is, uh, you know, good for society and sort of, you know, in terms of, how to bring some of these applications in a way that it doesn't actually hurt, uh, you know, economies uh, and that sort of, you know, thinking is going on right now within the regulatory space, right? Yeah. I think Europe is a bit ahead on some of this at the moment, right, in terms of uh, thinking through this. And I know there's a European AI regulation that is in the works uh, that, uh, that they've been working on. But I know that there are certain jurisdictions within the U.S. as well that have jumped ahead. A great example of this is the New York, uh, uh, you know, uh, government has basically jumped into the employment in AI space and has started writing some of the regulation around it. And I think it is forcing people to really think through what are the implications of this technology on society. So uh, I think the regulators are a bit behind at the moment. And in, in many ways, they're playing catch up with the speed at which the technology is being developed. Uh, but that is not uh, uncommon, just given how technology is evolving very quickly. Yeah. Um, there is a question that is very platform related, and I'm not sure if it's specifically for one of you to enable human intervention into any AI. How is this possible through your platform uh, need for modification by human to the existing algorithms? So, so maybe, uh, yeah, go, go for it, Balaji. Maybe, yeah, maybe. I mean, uh, since I'm I'm from the platform, so uh, so that there is a lot of so human brain writes its own theories on on AI. It's like uh, you, we imagine it's, it, it teaches by itself. We don't have any control. Actually, we have a lot of control. So today, uh, whatever in production, if we need to deploy um, um, a model or machine learning model, it's actually deployed by a human. We have ML ops engineer like any other ops. They we we get that we 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 get that we have deployment techniques within the platform which means which gives us a control so so as as any other for example like ups saves like 400 million uh, just by having the machine learning and then understood the deployed the ai models to just just to make sure their roots are very very right so they say 400 million and they want to change it they can change it so human intervention is always there and it's part of the deployment technique we all always have so we have we have the repositories of model and then we also score our uh, models performance and then in the unsupervised learning uh, we also score the real model using our turing uh, test whatever we have and then uh, we decide whether to promote the new model into product as are now and then that's that decision has been already made and um, we we have got raised on that so if i have answered that question purely on the platform perspective very good. I think that uh, Batsala has dropped off for a moment. So Martin, you had 10 seconds to add and then Sachit, I think you had 10 seconds as well. 
Let me um, let me just add add to what was just said. You know, think of um, observability and explainability as a methodology to to help answer the question of you know interacting with the model and adjusting it without uh, a dashboard of some sort to have metrics and KPIs. You have nothing to interact with. So I'll stop there because that's I, I went beyond ten seconds. Yeah, I'll just add that the ideal experience is one where humans do have a way to interact with the model and effectively uh, change some of the outputs that the model is uh, is is behaving right. And effectively, if the the right software allows you to do that in terms of uh, tuning those inputs. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This has been such a good panel. I wish we could go on longer. It went too fast. Um, I wanted to thank Vatsala and Sachit, Martin, Matthew, and Balaji for an excellent session. I also want to thank everyone for joining us today for the session. This session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.